thank you everyone for being here in the second day afternoon. It's, it's a long second day, but I hope we can raise your attention with a couple of interesting new things on young people. We will speak about young people today. And um, it is an issue always, right? We live in a time in a multiple crisis. We live in a time where we have absolutely have no idea how we will live in 10 years from now. It's really very specific time in our life. And um, I think uh, 30 years ago, we had an idea about what the future would be. Uh, today, we really don't know. So we are learning, we are thinking, we are discussing, we are experimenting all the time uh, in order to figure out how to get through the lots of crises we are living in and of course to maintain our good life. Moreover, there is war, so there are things which really don't know and, and uh, the, the world we are planning and experimenting is for a generation that comes after us who are the young people. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, um, it's our responsibility also to learn uh, and understand what, how they live, how they grew, because there's only one thing what we know, uh, that we have to prepare our kids. I have three kids of, in their late tens and, and 20s. So also as a parent as, and the society, what we have to do is to prepare them for something where they have to be resilient, they have to adapt and they have to change all the time and we really don't know how to do this, right? So we have to teach them for something which we don't know what it is. So actually it's very interesting to learn about how young people live and what do they think of the world and what they are ready for. So this is why I'm super happy to be here to that today with you and also the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, which made a fascinating big uh, report in the whole region of Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltic states, a um, comparative report, many of the country reports you can, you can find around yourself. And, and have with us uh, the authors of this report and also two commentators from the region. So I'd like to introduce you our speakers today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, show you um, Elena Avramoska, who was a chief uh, researcher uh, who put together this uh, series of, of studies. And also Andras Bironaj, who is director of the Policy Solutions Institute from Hungary, who was a contributor to the report. Elena is from the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And we also have two politicians with us, uh, young politicians. Well, I was a young politician and we are always supposed to speak about young people until we are young. So somehow people think that young people should speak about young people. But anyway, uh, it's very nice to have you both. And I practiced Agnieszka's name. Uh, Agnieszka Dimanowicz Bach, something like this, right? Thank you very much. And, um, and Olga Richterova from the Czech Republic and Agnieszka is from Poland and Andras is from Hungary. So we also have a nice representation of the region among our speakers. But first of all, I would like to give the floor to Elena. Uh, and I would like to ask you to say a couple of words about what this report, about what are the key funding, findings, especially the ones that you were surprised. Thank you so much, uh, Zsuzsa, and uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here at the Budapest Forum. Um, so yes, the Friedrich Heber Stiftung has been doing youth studies for the last couple of years, and right now we are finalizing uh, our biggest study, comparative one, on Central Europe and the Baltics. As you can see, we have also country-specific um, studies on the countries in the region. And we have quite a few striking uh, findings. And this is very interesting and an important report, I would say, because it's about region that um, is changing fast. And at the same time, it's still certain legacies of the Soviet past are still present and evident in our report. It's also a region that in the last years have experienced democratic backsliding in many of the countries. And it's the fastest shrinking region in terms of population across the world. And the, the proportion of young people living in the country is really becoming smaller and smaller. There is a high number of immigration and brain drain in the region. And it's very important to understand what young people 
um, across Central Eastern Europe and the Baltics think and feel about democracy and how we can address this democratic deficit. So to start on a little bit of a positive note, it's important to say that they feel quite positive about their own personal future, but they are very much negative about the future of their countries. And this is interesting, so probably being young be means being a little bit positive about yourself, but they are indeed very pessimistic about the future of their countries. And they are primarily concerned when we ask them about what are their biggest fears and concerns about the future, they say that unemployment, low wages and low pensions are their biggest worries which is kind of surprising for this demographic to be worried so much about low pensions already. Um, and similar studies across different regions in the world, for example, in Western Europe, in Germany, in France, when we ask what young people worry about, they, they would often point out they worry about climate change and the environment. So it seems really that materialistic concerns are shaping this region much more than uh, post-materialistic uh, concerns such as the climate uh, and the environment. And then we also find some striking examples in terms of their support for democracy. So we often assume that young people, by definition, should be very supportive of democracy. And we can say that yes, the majority would say that democracy is a better form uh, of government than any other. However, every fifth person would say that under certain circumstances, dictatorship would be a better form of government than democracy, and every tenth person categorically rejects democracy. And this is quite worrying coming from this demographic, which, by the way, is between the age of 15 and 29. Um, and they're also very distrustful of their national institutions, are extremely distrustful of their national, uh, of the political parties in their countries. They trust the police, they trust uh, the judiciary, especially in uh, the Baltic states, but not across the board. And they're very much pro-European and very trustful of NATO. So they're, they trust international institutions, but they're really distrustful of their national governments, of the political parties. And uh, this is also evident in the way that they don't like to participate so much in political life. Uh, they categorically reject being, having to do anything with politics, especially um, those from Central Europe. In the Baltics, they are a bit more interested in politics, but those in Central Europe, they are like, okay, we don't want to, ha we don't want to do anything with politics, we don't want to participate in political decision making, and they feel that um, actually the current government do not care about this demographic, that the policies that the governments are making are not for them and they are not interested in those. So I would stop here. This is like setting the scene. I hope it's not very negative, although our <laughs> findings are sometimes surprisingly negative. And uh, yes, and then we can continue sharing more insights as we go on. Thank you very much. Uh, for the quick snapshot, and uh, I would like to ask Andras now to go on probably more in details on, on Hungary. You have all microphones, so can you please take your personal mic? Yes, wonderful. <coughs> yeah. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. Uh, actually, it was a pleasure to participate in such an ambitious project on uh, youth research. I have to tell you that it's a rare opportunity in Central and Eastern Europe to have the opportunity to participate in such an in-depth research on so many countries with the same methodology at the same time. And what happened here is that we uh, had the opportunity to uh, do this uh, uh, representative research on youth pe young people uh, uh, at the same time last year in seven countries. And as it was mentioned, the uh, final comparative report will be out in uh, two weeks' time, but you can already see the country reports. Uh, I'm one of the authors of the Hungary country report, and I also contributed to the Central and Eastern European comparative one. Uh, when, we have at, uh, when we have a look at the results, I think that we can have mixed feelings, so that we can, of course, see some negative trends and some worrying trends, but at the same time, there are reasons to be hopeful, and I will tell now a few examples for uh, uh, both reasons. Uh, uh, st let's start with the negative side. I believe that one of the most striking things, not only about Hungary, but also about uh, many other countries in the region, is that how 
a political uh, the, the young people uh, are. I just tell you a concrete number from the V4. Actually, 50% of uh, young people in Visegrad countries feel that they are not represented by the political elite, and it's in the single digits the share of those who think that they are well represented by the political elite. The interest in politics is extremely low in Hungary compared to the other uh, V4 countries, but the average result for the V4 is also uh, pre pretty low. Uh, this already suggests what, uh, what the point is about Hungary, is that the Hungarian youth is the most disappointed and the most disillusioned with the political uh, regime. Uh, not only with the Orban regime, but with how politics works in general in the entire uh, region. While at the same time, uh, I have to tell you, it was quite a surprising result that the Polish youngsters seem to be the most active politically uh, uh, in, in the region, uh, not necessarily in terms of electoral participation, but when it comes to uh, political participation beyond elections, civic activism or demonstrations and so on. Uh, so that was kind of a, a, a surprisingly positive result about uh, uh, Poland. But regarding interest in politics, just to give you a flavor of how, uh, how Hungarian youngsters think about uh, politics, only 22% of Hungarian youngsters said that they were interested in politics, while 50% of them said that they are not interested in politics. And beyond the low interest in politics, what I would also highlight is uh, uh, the low trust in political parties, low trust in government, as well as low trust in how democracy works, especially in Hungary. And maybe just one more uh, uh, worrying trend, and this is the high willingness of emigration uh, in, the, in the region. And it's also especially true for the Polish youngsters and the Hungarian ones. And what is absolutely striking, and probably this was one of the most surprising things in the Hungary research, was the extreme polarization already at such a young age, which was not something typical of the other V4 uh, countries, so not at that level, at least. But in terms of the Hungarian youngsters, what we saw, and this was striking when it comes to emigration especially, is that three times more opposition voter youngsters said that they are willing to leave the country on the long term than Fidesz voter youngsters, the concrete numbers was, uh, were 12% for the Fidesz voters and 36% for the opposition voters, which shows that it really has to do something with how they see uh, democracy working in practice and the Orban regime working in practice uh, in Hungary. Another point that I would uh, probably highlight when it comes to this regional comparative research, but again, especially on Hungary, is that the general dissatisfaction with everything, basically, with education, with how democracy works, with politics, with parties, and also with, uh, uh, with the economic situation of their families. So if we take this general dissatisfaction into account, then it's probably surprising that it's not translated into activity but it's rather translated into passivity. So this satisfaction, especially in the Hungarian context, goes together with, uh, with some kind of passivity. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, the Hungarian youngsters especially uh, do not protest or do not choose resistance when it comes to their dissatisfaction, but they rather choose the strategy of exit so that they potentially leave the country if they are really, really fed up with the system or they're really fed up with uh, the uh, lack of opportunities uh, in their lives. Passive youth, actually, I believe, is quite good news for the Orban regime. And the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, the young uh, uh, voters are heavily underrepresented among Orban supporters and Fidesz voters, uh, because this is actually one of the uh, major trends, demographic trends in terms of party preferences over the last decade since 2010, that the Fidesz voting base became uh, older than ever, uh, rural than ever, and it has more support among uh, lower educated uh, segments of the society, and this also means that it's uh, less popular among the higher educated and also the urban people and the young people. So if disappointed young people choose not to protest and not to participate, 
then it means that this is the perfect result for the current regime in Hungary. And I actually always thought that Poland is in a much better situation than, than Hungary from many uh, perspectives, from many, many, many aspects. Uh, also, that the, I, I believe that in Poland the civil society is much stronger than here in uh, uh, Hungary. Also, the media that is independent from the regime is much stronger in Poland than in Hungary. And also, for me, it seems that the Polish youth is much more active and much more willing to do something for their own future than the Hungarian uh, uh, youngsters. One of the most uh, uh, striking results about the Polish youth for me was that it, it proved to be the most tolerant and the less nationalistic uh, youth segment uh, in the entire region. So in Poland, I believe there is much more hope for an active, more tolerant uh, uh, young uh, movement than in Hungary uh, currently. And to say a few words about, uh, about hope, so on the positive <laughs> side as well, after so many uh, uh, rather depressing results, is uh, that uh, actually I believe it's a, it, it's a pretty good news that uh, the vast majority of the youngsters in the region and also in Hungary are, are pro-democracy. And in the Hungarian context, most Hungarian youngsters are really uh, 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 fed up with how democracy is misused in the Hungarian context. So when it comes to the evaluation of the quality of democracy, they are te tending to be negative, but when it comes to the ins institutional settings of a democracy, then they are quite open to that. So I, I think that uh, from our perspective, the numbers that we saw, uh, I, I would rather interpret it as a positive one regarding uh, how pro-democracy the attitudes uh, are. Another uh, positive uh, thing that I believe can be used in future and must be used in future campaigns in, in uh, Central and Eastern Europe is the pro-Europeanness of, uh, of, the, of the youngsters, and it's true for all countries. In the, uh, in, in the Visegrad regions, in Hungary as well. There is no appetite for Huxit, for Hungary's potential exit of the uh, European Union. It's around 10% the, the support for that in, uh, in this age group, which is from 15 to 29, uh, while at the same time, approximately two thirds of the uh, youngsters in Hungary still support Hungary's uh, EU membership. And mo even more importantly, because I believe that this, this really shows the depth of the pro-European attitudes and orientations in, in Hungary, is that the EU is considered as a posit positive reference point from many perspectives. And this is what uh, the, the, the study illustrates with many numbers, and especially the economic performance uh, and what the EU can contribute economically and socially to the quality of life to the people is considered as a very positive reference point. And, and uh, the youngsters give a much more favorable opinion about the European Union than about their national governments in most respects when it comes to the comparison between the two, the EU and the national government. And I believe that this is what guarantees the long-term support for EU membership in these countries, including Hungary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andras. This is, this is really nice that you gave this, this positive outcome. However, when I read a snapshot of any kind of youth research, it's, it's very interesting to see whether this data that one-tenth of young people are not happy with democracy and actually open to other kind. Is it much or not? I mean, 90% are very ready. They are protecting their, their life. Uh, democracy. So we, we don't really know, you know, if, if we don't see it in a process, whether this is growing, it's slowing, maybe it was always like this. So uh, this is why it's very nice to have this as a comparative report, of course. And I think the value of the report comes out that we have uh, comparative data uh, between countries. And of course, then you can, you can see uh, differences and maybe some consequences. But we have to two persons with us who are the target group of this report. Yes, but I suppose one of the reasons you do this at the Ebert Stiftung because you want politicians to read it and you want them to do something. So because there was already so much speech about Poland, I'd like to ask Agnieszka first what this report uh, gave you as a, as a surprise. Was it as a surprise in, or any information you, you found in it? Uh, is it working? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, first of all, of, um, for having me here and uh, for presenting such a great and useful practical, of, of practical use um, report. Uh, and let me start with, uh, because we, 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 we listen to researchers, I'm here as a politician, and I would like to state the obvious that uh, such uh, research, such a uh, report, uh, report is useful because it is obvious that every political force, every political par party, every political uh, group uh, wants and is good to have um, young people on board and engaged. Uh, both in terms of um, part of their electorate, but also as, um, uh, as um, active members. And I'm saying that because that should goes without, uh, go, go without uh, question that young people are crucial for creating a certain climate around political debate. Young people validate political, um, political agenda. So they are important even uh, if, as you said, in uh, numbers they are less significant part of uh, electorate than the, uh, the older, uh, older groups. So there is somewhat instrumental motivation uh, to include younger generation into political um, process. Uh, it shouldn't be um, ignored or we as politicians shouldn't uh, pretend that it's not also about, um, about that. But the stake, the true stake is much, much uh, higher, the true stake of um, young um, people uh, engagement. Um, there are some specific features uh, of younger people engagement that are unique and useful also for strengthening the uh, democratic uh, processes. And in countries such as Hungary, but also in Poland, where democrat democracy is threatened, um, it, is, um, on, on, it is especially uh, important. And what was surprising or striking for me from this report uh, is that uh, young people in Poland, unlike uh, in Hungary, act politically mainly when they feel personally uh, threatened uh, by political decisions. So their demand to be included could be or should be recognized uh, as um, important indicator that something important is going on, that some important values are uh, in uh, dangers or, or in danger or uh, some interests are in danger that can have broader consequences uh, in society and also in, uh, in the future. Uh, for young Poles, their agendas are usually very honest. They don't care about uh, something that is not worth caring about for, for, for uh, themselves. Uh, for example, due to um, one of the most restrictive anti-abortion law, uh, young uh, women in Poland, but also to some extent um, uh, young, uh, young male, are very much engaged and interested in the uh, you know, fight for the full reproductive, women's uh, reproductive rights. They are concerned about that because it affects them, but the broader consequences of this uh, status quo, uh, quo are far beyond individualistic. Uh, it's, for example, demographic crisis, family planning crisis, uh, increased immigration of uh, young people, uh, which in turn has some other consequences for other aspects of social and economic uh, situation of, um, of Poland. So it is good to listen, I think it's good to listen and watch uh, what is triggering young people to act and to, to form their uh, demands, not only in order to address their needs, but also uh, as, um, to, to, to understand what important processes are currently uh, going on. But at the same time, uh, they, when they act when they are politically threatened, but at the same time, young Poles are not very politically conscious. That was uh, also in your, your um, funding. I think that decades long dominance of um, neoliberal technocratic politi political discourse in Poland stripped young people from complex political uh, alternatives and their actions and political attitudes are based more on intuitions. They are not politically educated, which means that they know what they want, 
but they don't know how to be vocal about it in political, in political terms. Hence this need for young oriented political parties, political organizations or social organizations to help them translate their, uh, their needs into political uh, agenda, to politicize their demands. And this is important also because without, or with this um, ongoing or deep and the depoliticization of uh, young uh, people agenda, they are becoming more and more um, open for populists uh, and authoritarian uh, narratives. At this point, they are, as you, uh, as you mentioned, they are quite critical towards, um, uh, towards the state and towards this attempt of uh, stripping um, uh, um, of democracy. But uh, it's, it, it, it is important to keep them politically uh, active and uh, engaged in order to safeguard them or us um, before this, uh, this uh, threat. So I think that the, um, the main conclusion for this report is, practical conclusion, is that our task as young oriented um, politicians uh, uh, is to find issues um, important for young people that could be easily translated into political agenda uh, in order to keep them uh, engaged. I think that one very specific uh, issue is the relation between Catholic Church and the state. Uh, there is a huge division, uh, generational division between young, uh, younger Poles and older uh, Poles uh, in, in regards to that. Um, young Poles are very interested in dividing state and uh, church, but right now, for now, they are showing that uh, uh, individually, yeah, I, I'm, I'm finishing. Uh, only by withdrawing from uh, individual relig religious uh, practices and not yet as a political demand or, or agenda. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's, um, yeah, it's very interesting what a Polish politician can see out of the debate. And finally, we also would like to learn from you, Olga, what was your surprise in this report regarding the Czech Republic? Thank you. Yeah, this is working. Once again, thanks for having me here. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am here as uh, a representative of a youth-oriented party that's becoming old. Uh, now, I may look very young, but I am 37. And uh, since um, 2012, which is the year when I began to be active, uh, my party has grown older, uh, just as I have. Uh, why am I stressing this? Because um, given, given the findings and numbers we'll be discussing and we are discussing at the moment, I may be taken as a bit of an example of youth in action, changing uh, with the time in politics. Uh, maybe we'll come to this together, Agnieszka. Um, just... Uh, to remind you uh, of an event, maybe long forgotten, maybe not. Uh, years ago, there was this um, so-called um, Pirate Bay, a website that was taken down, and it was the beginning of Pirate Party movements, which was a generational political agenda, agenda, um, agenda based on the freedom of the internet. Uh, from that on, this began in Sweden, spread all, o all over the world. From this, um, my Czech Pirate Party was, was founded. What's important, what's uh, interesting in comparison to the findings, um, it was a genera generational thing, um, something that was very personal. Uh, the need for protecting uh, freedom of the internet that was very important uh, for the young people, and it translated into a new party that is now, for example, in my country, in the government. So, uh, I could um, confirm the finding that um, young people tend to be apol apolitical when it's not their business to care, but once something very important to them uh, is threatened, they can get very, very uh, vocal about it. Um, so that would be one point that um, in my country it's probably a little bit different um, because new parties emerge quite frequently. 
and new parties also often form new opportunities for the participation of young people. Um, number two uh, that I would like to uh, remark upon um, is the fact that um, since uh, young people mobilize around topics, they don't want to be so much connected to institutions. That's one of the key findings, I think. Um, it's all about what's, what are those crucial topics in the respective country. And one of your findings is um, attitudes to migration, for example, that differ significantly uh, among uh, those respective countries. I was thinking maybe it's worth mentioning that the Czech Republic youth is different in this respect uh, when it comes to uh, attitudes to LGBTQ um, uh, people. Because uh, when you look at other research or other uh, polls, uh, Czech youth until up to the age of 35 uh, is in this respect um, like the Western youth. Our numbers, our support uh, for uh, equal marriage, our support for LGBTQ rights is the same as in uh, Western European countries. I am just saying this because there probably is a strong link, link uh, to the difference in my country, which is uh, that there is not, not such a strong influence of the church and of religion uh, in politics. Um, what's striking, though, is that this does not translate uh, to attitudes to migration. I think it's because migration has been misused in my country for years as a political topic to create divide, to have those campaigns uh, dividing between them, threatening us, etc. And maybe uh, the last uh, remark on um, the finding that might pass uh, away unnoticed, and it's about uh, the age uh, when people become interested in politics, when they go to polls more reliably, and I think it's simply the age of uh, becoming parents, becoming uh, rooted in a place. And it's a moment when people simply need state services, such as kindergarten, schools. They go to, they need healthcare more often with small kids, etc. So probably um, it's not a finding um, that would relate to this study only. But I think uh, what we should keep in mind is. Um, very often young people do not encounter the state that often. They don't have to do, they don't have to deal with the state that often. When they're studying, they don't even need to register with some uh, state authorities. However, once they're adults, meaning they need the state, they need government services, they realize maybe the government's not delivering. Now that I am in the position of the one who needs to deliver, I know how hard it is. <laughs> and um, I just want to underline this. Once we understand the issues that are crucial to the youth, in my country it's, for example, issues regarding um, legislation on sexual violence. We don't have uh, modern um, legislation on, um, on, for example, rape then it's the youth that takes action. Otherwise, as long as uh, they are not really personally uh, touched or threatened, yeah, they rem remain usually active within the civil society, within NGOs. Thank you very much. It's really uh, interesting that you brought up other research uh, input, which is correlating very much of, of your findings. I would like to ask one short question of all of you. Uh, and then we open the floor so you, you can think about questions. Uh, and the first question, I try to be a pro provocative. So, um, Elena, I, uh, there were a couple of interesting findings on women on this report. Uh, first of all, one statement says that women has much less um, employment opportunities than men, which was uh, surprising to me. I, I actually didn't, didn't think this especially in some countries, really big difference. Uh, um, the other one is that women, which we actually know, that women are less interested in politics uh, than men. Um, 
first question is why, so I actually didn't have, find many other data on, on, on gender differences, so I, I was lacking a bit some more details about you know what we know from women and and, and men so is there is there a, a concept or or do you think it's um do we enough uh, do know do we know enough of of the differences not only political participation but in general this this report gives a um, deep enough uh, reference to gender sensitive data yes so it's working yes so as I mentioned, uh, socioeconomic issues are really one of the main things young people worry about in this region. And uh, there is high unemployment across, um, regarding youth across all the countries, especially in the Baltics, especially for women. So being at risk of being unemployed if you're a woman in the Baltics is going up to 70%, which is really striking number and quite surprising. We can't answer right now why is that the case. This is like quite surprising finding. But we also find like very interesting and surprising findings with regards to political participation and political interest. So while it's true that men are more interested in politics, they're specifically more interested in specific type of politics and that is political parties and being part of, uh, let's say, being interested in taking political office, being part of a government. On the other side, young women are more interested in demonstrations. They're more uh, likely to sign a petition to basically use different newer forms of political participation. So there is maybe something about like men still being interested in the power aspect of politics and women really being more interested in certain changes. And especially, for example, the data on Poland is quite interesting because we see that young women were very much present in the protests that were, um, yeah, with regards to uh, the ban on abortion and also uh, LGBT, uh, pro-LGBT movement uh, protests, whereas young men were somehow leaning towards more like right-wing uh, protests and and so on. So there is something here, yes. And there's also something else that is very interesting that uh, when we ask what young men and women care about, young women would often say we care about equality. And not only gender equality, they also very much care about social equality. Whereas young men would say, oh, we want to be independent, to have a good career, to advance in life, and to take political um, uh, office, to be in power. So it's, it's quite interesting that here, like in 2022, we still have some of those traditional forms of uh, gender differences that are permeating the, the region um, at large. Yeah. So Agnieszka. What a woman politician has to do with this? It seems to be a leadership question. If women all want to go to demonstration, do the big jobs, and they can take uh, every uh, burden, but they don't want to take, you know, leadership roles and, and office. So, what what you as a as a woman politician can uh, can do with this? Well, it certainly is a provocative um, question uh, since we still uh, in Poland, even on the oppos democratic opposition uh, side, we still uh, lack uh, women, female uh, leadership, at least in... Uh, and you have the most in Central Europe, you know, the Polish. Yeah, but in, you, you, you are talking about the percentage um, of MPs in uh, Parliament. You yes, have the most. It is, it is growing, and it is, uh, it is growing, but it's still... Uh, it's still uh, not uh, equal, and the positions, key positions uh, in, in in politics, is still uh, they are still occupied uh, mainly by uh, by men. But it is changing, and the demand of that change is uh, getting more and more uh, loud, uh, and it's being raised not only by uh, women, not only by young women, but it it uh, it is being mainstreamed. In uh, in many ways, especially after uh, especially after the, the, the this second wave of uh, um, of, of protests um, against the total uh, uh, total abortion um, abortion ban. Um, but um, so so this this is the protest that we are in the middle of uh, in the in, in the middle in this in this uh, protest, but we are not yet uh, reached the the, uh, the goal. Uh, at the same time, there is a, uh, I think, m m stronger, bigger division uh, between a uh, gender division between, um, when it comes to political views. Uh, 
uh, young um, uh, women in Poland are much more progressive uh, than uh, young male. We could uh, see that uh, on the streets, uh, whether it's a nationalistic march uh, in November in Poland, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, mainly... Uh, they are on, on, on the question on is how, how yeah. can you exploit this? I mean, if there are these women who they are yeah. really value-oriented, they are also active, so why cannot, you know, then they turn it towards a real change? Actually, they are. They are. Mm -hmm. When you, once, once again, the example of, um, of uh, women's reproductive uh, right. What we see after the many years of uh, continuing protests uh, is that even uh, right-wing political parties are changing slightly their political stance and they, uh, their agenda. We can see that also in changing the, um, the um, society attitudes. Uh, there are research that shows that even uh, voters of law and justice of, uh, or, or far-right voters are shifting slightly, of course, uh, towards more progressive or central uh, central agenda. So the work is being done, but uh, it's not necessarily reflected um, in, uh, in, in terms of leadership, positions, power. Uh, this is something uh, that I think is ne next, um, next, uh, next chapter. Yeah. Well, it's definitely a lifelong process. Olga, you wanted to comment on this. Yeah, I'd love to comment and I would love to thank um, Andrea, who is over there, who is a uh, woman from the Czech Republic and also uh, a very active person in uh, her NGO. And I'm saying this because that's the typical role of women who want to be active in public uh, life in my country. Uh, being uh, like taking a specific topic and being very active on this topic. I, I've been uh, for years in politics now and like uh, I am. Uh, I have already been five years in the parliament and I can say that every bigger topic I was successful on was because thanks to cooperation with the civil sector, with some NGO focusing on the topic. Uh, why do I say this? Because it's uh, really a gendered issue, um, women active on a specific area, not really entering politics. One more example on this, in my party, we are very open uh, to anyone and still we have a significantly lower number of uh, female members than of men. Uh, we are trying to tackle those barriers, but it's very difficult when simply the interest is much higher in, in men to become members. It's not about power, but it's simply about membership. The difference is striking. Only about 26 or 27 percent are women of members. And we are a centrist liberal party, formed especially by people in their 30s. Um, probably uh, in my country, in the Czech Republic, the reason is mainly practical, and that is simply the lack of childcare facilities. Once you are uh, a woman and you want to have children, which is the dream of most of my. Uh, uh, fellow fellow uh, country women, um, it's very difficult to balance family and career, balance um, public life, especially if in the beginning it always needs huge investment in time, in um, energy, sometimes in money. And given this um, yeah, window of opportunity to have family and children, many women just decide against it. I myself have two kids and I can only combine my job with family thanks to being elected to represent Prague, the capital where the parliament sits. Um, to sum up, we have, uh, I think, um, this practical barrier which is still being underestimated, lack of childcare facilities. When we look at countries with higher female representation in business boards, anywhere in positions of importance, there you see good quality uh, childcare from the age of one and a half years, two years of age. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what's the situation in other uh, countries uh, that, that were in the research. In my country also, the quality of kindergarten, of childcare from three years on, 
is not so high. There are huge differences, but many, especially educated mothers, really think about uh, spending more time with their children so that they have better opportunities in the future, because not all uh, kindergarten options are of good quality. Just one number, the limit for children from the age of three that can be together in one classroom is 28 in my country. In practice, there is usually around 20 kids, but this is the official limit. So it's impossible to pay attention to the little uh, ones once the limit is this high. Well, definitely, it's, uh, it's also the, the ambition, the encouragement for younger women to turn towards uh, positions, in, not only in politics, in business, in, in, in media, everywhere. And the other is to provide the, the environment that they can actually manage a family, which is uh, somehow not so, such a big problem for men. However, it's also a burden on men. Well, um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Andras, why are people are migrating from their countries? You, you spoke about Hungary and you, you mentioned political reasons, but it's not the only thing, right? They're from the whole region, uh, at various level, people are uh, leaving. This is very striking a number that and in average 25% 25, 25 of young people in, the, in this given um, demographic age are actually intending to move abroad, pro most probably in the EU, but also in the United States. So that is really very high level. And I, I could see the report also some economic um, relevances, so that like the Czech Republic, that's not so severe. But for example, in some of the Baltic countries, which are economically better off, still people are living in high numbers. So um, it's really a huge problem for economics, for dem demographic, for the futures of what this whole region is one of the greatest problem. Um, What's the point when you think can can be tackled? You know, what, what's the kind of uh, inflection point where 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 really really have to intervene and and political elites must see that they have to do something, otherwise we become depopulated by the smartest and the most innovative uh, generation or part of our young generation. <clears throat> yeah, the, pr probably then. Uh, this is the point where the economic and social situation uh, comes in and, the, uh, and how youngsters see their uh, economic prospects in their uh, countries. So it's true that uh, what was mentioned, that uh, compared to the situation of the country, uh, the youngsters see their own pro uh, perspectives on the long term a little bit uh, uh, better and they have a much more positive view on that. But it, it's of course not at all uh, uh, irrelevant where, in which country they imagine that uh, future. Because when we, uh, when we uh, investigate this, uh, we see that the, uh, their economic situation is probably the uh, most worrying uh, aspect, especially in Hungary. Uh, low salaries come on top when, when uh, even long-term concerns are, uh, are, 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 are discussed. Also, increasingly housing problems. This is what we see, that uh, this is a major problem. Also, the uh, prospects of having a job uh, which requires the qualification that they have. And this is where I want to jump back on the gender issue, because I have one more uh, aspect to that, which hasn't been discussed uh, so far, because we have some serious problems in the labor market as well. Because what uh, we saw in the results in all uh, V4 countries is that women think it much more likely that they will get a job uh, for which they are overqualified. And this is, their, this is their personal experience as well, and this is what they fear from the future as well, that uh, they do their education in vain, and they will not be able to do a proper job that would be uh, requiring their uh, quali qualification. Um, regarding the, the, the issues that could uh, be uh, important for, uh, for, for young people, because we have touched on it earlier uh, in, the, in this discussion, and something that hasn't been uh, mentioned so far is the issue of corruption, 
which seems to uh, us that in all countries, young people are much more receptive to this issue than, than older uh, generations. It is surely the case in Hungary, but we saw it in the results of other countries as well. We saw it as a top three issue when it comes to uh, the current uh, problems of the country. Then uh, among young people, it comes really, really uh, high. Uh, also, the green commitment from the political parties, I believe, is very important. And on a day which is uh, 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 covering mostly sustainability issues here at the Budapest Forum, I think it must be mentioned that besides the materialistic concerns, what is also striking is how important some post-materialistic issues became for the youngsters and climate change comes on the top among these uh, uh, post-materialistic uh, issues. So these are issues that I think that the uh, more progressive forces uh, in all countries could exploit a little bit more. Thank you very much. It's the time to open the floor. So any of you who have questions, raise your hand and I'm very happy to give you the, the uh, microphone. Is there anyone? Okay, yes. Yes, it's here. In okay, you, you come next. Uh, hi. Uh, Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, Kamil Jaranczyk from Visegrad Insight. Um, uh, I, um, thank you for the panel. It's very interesting. Something that I felt was, uh, hasn't been addressed uh, uh, yet, especially in the Czech Republic and in Poland, this is an issue that uh, younger voters are swinging, uh, of course, to the left, uh, but also to the right, uh, to the far right in a lot of cases. Uh, these um, uh, uh, straight, uh, straight young men. So, uh, how does it look? How how do you? Why do you believe that uh, a lot of young voters are going, you know, to the far far right? And uh, how uh, do you um, how do you bring people back from that? Or or is that even a strategy that's uh, worth pursuing? Uh, thank you very much. Do they go to the right, the young people? I just wanted to say that I don't think that's the case for the Czech Republic. They are very centrist, the youth. They only get radicalized uh, in those uh, margin of 10% of uh, anti-democratic yeah. Uh, yeah, percentage. Elena, maybe you can reply. Yeah, so they, they are very centrist. Uh, the results from our survey show that they are like mostly um, centrist, except for Poland, where one third of young people actually identify uh, with uh, left parties. So there is some hope there. In Poland, yeah. And in Hungary, this is uh, more like a past experience because when Jobbik made its breakthrough in the early 2010s, then actually Jobbik had the highest support among, uh, among the youngsters because by that time, uh, it was uh, the most evident choice for a youngster who wanted to choose a new party. But since then, we have had another... Uh, parties that could attract potentially uh, young people. Momentum, a liberal centrist party, is being one of them that came to the Hungarian political scene uh, five years ago. Okay, so we have a question here, and then you, and then you with the glasses. Thank you. Can, can you just stand up? We can hear you and see you. Okay, better. thank you. I have a very, I have a very short question. And this is a hypothetical question. So what if the discussed countries, you know, lots of young people start to in show interest in politics, could they able to achieve any change, for example, this Hungarian deformed system? Well, if all young people would be active, could they make a dif difference? In Hungary. Then well, <laughs> the question was... Specific. Yeah, Hungary or... Uh, 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 let's uh, talk at, about at least, Hungary, that's at, the most at least, complicated. At least this was the hope of the Hungarian opposition this spring. That if, if the Hungarian youngsters would turn up in big numbers, then uh, they could prevent uh, uh, the Fidesz government winning big uh, again, and something that didn't really materialize. One example when uh, the appearance of youngsters proved to be already decisive was actually the primary elections that was held uh, by the opposition last autumn. Then it was considered that at an election where 800,000 people participated, which was a lot in a country of 10 million just for a primary of the uh, opposition, approximately 200,000 new voters appeared uh, for the second round of the uh, uh, primaries, and this proved to be vital uh, for, for, a, for a surprise rise of, uh, 
of an anti-corruption candidate, by the way, who failed in the end, but that's another story, and it was a story of six months later, but during the uh, primary elections, it showed that something which offered the novelty, something which, which uh, what, what offered the uh, anti-corruption and the renewal of politics was something that was needed by uh, the, the young voters. So in theory, I would say yes, if in Hungary, the young voters would turn up in much bigger numbers than first of all, it would mean that the political parties and the leading political parties should uh, uh, address this issue and should come up with uh, political campaigns that offer more uh, answers to the concerns of the young people. Because what, how I see the Hungarian political campaigns is that it is, they are more tailor-made towards pensioners, they are more tailor-made towards those segments of the society who come and participate in much bigger numbers and then the uh, key issues of the youngsters are addressed much less. So this would be clearly one effect what uh, would be materialized if the youngsters would appear in bigger numbers. And of course, if the young youngsters would uh, participate in elections in bigger numbers, it would also mean that most probably uh, Viktor Orbán couldn't win this big. Probably a two-thirds majority would have been avoidable. Uh, but, of course, in a much tighter race, they could even make uh, the difference. This was originally the hope of the Hungarian opposition, which didn't materialize. Could you hold for a second, please? Because I will not forget you, and please don't forget your question. But I'd like to f have a follow-up question on this, because there was a couple of very interesting uh, data in this report on, on, uh, on uh, young people's political participation. And one thing was that Three, four percent of all of them are active in politics. Thirty, forty percent have never ever talks about politics. Not even in at home, not even with friends, never. Basically completely live out of politics. Many of them say that they feel they are completely unprepared. They just don't know of anything of politics. Uh, there is also a data in this report which shows that those people, those young people who speak about politics at home and with friends, they are getting to be more active and they also vote more actively. Um, yesterday, we had a panel where uh, Mathieu Lefebvre from More in Common was speaking about and he uh, mentioned a report from various European countries and what they say there is a pattern that approximately one third of the each society, wherever we are, feel left behind, who always feel that no political elite ever speaks to them. And we also know this from your report that most of young people feel that the politics doesn't talk to them. So I see here an incredible window of opportunity for politicians. There is one third of, a popula of each of our population, a significant part young people who feel left behind, who feel they never, their stories are never told. And of course, what your question, not only young people, but no one really is active if there is no some political leadership, right? So it's political leaders who have to mobilize young people to, to do something and to feel involved. So I'm not turning to our two politicians, whether you have a language to, to young people Olga and then uh, Agnieszka. If I may, um, this is exactly the question we are asking ourselves in my party and probably all other parties are asking this because once you get in, like with the Pirate Party, we used to be the cool party with a strange name and um, a leader with dreadlocks, which he still has dreadlocks, but he's over 40. So not young anymore and um, that's what happens with time uh, you only speak to the youth when you are young yourself and then later on you may be like acceptable but why is that i mean they're, they're, they are there no one is talking to them uh, there, there is a potential they will be the future uh, I, I am just trying to make the point of language the la I'm, I'm a linguist myself originally and language of the youth is always highly different from the language of people 10 years older it's a very it's a it's a striking thing it really is um, um, a question of culture also the way we dress uh, and the way um, 
people approach those who are established in the system. And I mean, no matter how, how important the issues as such are, that for example, um, we, we, just to give you a, a, an example how we approached as a, as a political party, the youth, we did a poll, we identified the topics that were important to the youth, we um, did a specific targeted campaign at university students, uh, at those um, aged 18 to 26, 27, because those were specific topics, so we tailored the campaign, it did work, but still, uh, the only thing that really, really worked was connecting it to a face of someone who is 22 to 24. And it's something that just everybody needs, seeing someone like him, like himself, herself, in politics. Everybody needs being represented uh, in Czech politics, and I'm afraid it's the same for all the discussed countries. Uh, politics is pretty homogeneous, and minorities are not represented, women are not represented, and young people are not so well represented as a group. And so for me, originally, a person who could represent this age group, I am realizing I am not their representative anymore to that extent as I used to be. And it's simply time. You need more young people in your yeah. party. So Agnieszka. Well, I would both agree and slightly disagree with, uh, with you. And because of course, representation matters. And it is, it is important to include as many young uh, people in our parties, in our electoral list as, uh, as it is possible, because there are certain aspects of connection of dialogue with the uh, younger generation that is unreachable for the uh, older um, politician. But at the same time, I don't really feel that we should um, um, resign of, um, from attempt to come into the dialogue with the younger generation just because we're getting older. For example, and it is an anecdota, one of the most popular uh, politician, women politicians from my party uh, on TikTok which is obviously the medium for, for, for the very young generation, is over 60. And she is fantastic with them. She talks about uh, education, about um, students' rights, about women's rights, and they love their, uh, her, and she is an icon idol for uh, for them so it we should try to explore uh, different uh, approaches and the uh, second uh, second th um, thing that I would like to say is that I think that the big, one of the biggest challenge for um, for political parties for politicians is to realize that the role of uh, young people in politics is not only uh, quantitative but also qualitative it's not only about uh, the number of young people that uh, show up at the ballot box, but also how many uh, of them um, engage in the discussion, in the campaign, in the debate, at their homes with their parents and grandparents, because the ability of younger people to create certain climate of the debate, to mm, shift uh, others towards some uh, ideas is, uh, is, is, is re really great. So maybe the first step to engage young people um, uh, more is to invite them just to the table to the discussion and then the second one can be just to pull them stronger to the to, to, to become a voters it's quite fascinating that there's a debate on the stage but we must give the floor to this gentleman who is waiting one sentence, one sentence. because I, I probably didn't explain properly for example um, w what happens in every organization is that people stay those who are experienced stay. And what I meant is that simply we must keep in mind making place for new people, including young people. So that was my point I wanted to make. Okay, so that here, thank you very much for waiting. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tivadar Balaj. I'm a freelancer. And uh, my question is uh, related to women. Uh, so for them to be able to uh, find work and also to be able to raise kids, uh, what role do you see in re uh, the availability in remote work opportunities and how, what do you think a state could do to incentivize to, to, be, uh, to have more remote works for, for women, for example? 
Okay, I just wonder whether there is any more question. Okay, if not, then who would like to speak about that? Olga, ready. Good. Thank you for the question. It's again the practicality that in the end defines the matter. In my country, unfortunately, part-time jobs and uh, home office is not that widely spread. Of course, COVID did help. Uh, it showed that, um, I mean, in this respect, it did not help or, or in general, but it opened uh, the window of opportunity for uh, showing that uh, home office works for both sides uh, in some job um, areas. But ha unfortunately, uh, part-time jobs are simply very underrepresented uh, in our labor market. So, for example, we have only recently passed a law supporting um, part-time jobs, and we hope that this will encourage uh, more employers and more women to take advantage of that. Actually, a uh, part-time job is a double sword edge, right? So, first, it helps families and uh, women so that they can go to the school in the morning and in the afternoon be at home on time. But what about men? So uh, those women who are doing that less half, uh, make half, half of the uh, salary, they are already underpaid. And, uh, you know, uh, higher status work need more presence. So this also limits women's, uh, women's progress in work. So I, I am very skeptical, but that was my contribution. And Dalma would like to uh, ask a question. No, don't go to discussion with him, please. So if you have question to the, thank you very much. Because I know, I know her and you, I know she knows a lot about this. So, but we, I would like to give a final yeah, round yeah. Uh, uh, to, the, sorry, to our I, speakers. I have uh, only one very short question. How, how much concern the young generation in the, uh, your countries about the war and uh, the, the increasing militarization uh, in, in uh, Poland, Czech, Hungary? Etc. Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you very much. Well, our time is almost over. I would like to give all of you the floor for one whatever uh, kind of final remarks you would like to make. Uh, and uh, who is going to, someone should definitely answer. Maybe you don't all answer the war issue, but if you have some, some uh, kind of final comment, it would be very nice uh, from all of you. So I would like to, who would like to start? Olga. Yes, wonderful, thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, very, very, sorry, sorry, uh, for the very topical question. Um, in my country, uh, the general support uh, for Ukraine is very high, uh, and um, I think it's the same for Poland, uh, and the, the level of solidarity is actually in stark contrast to the findings of the study, of the, of the analysis, uh, with respect to migration. Uh, so, uh, with this, I want to say uh, that um, with specific situations, societies react differently, and here in this case, I think the youth is on board with the whole society, very many volunteers, very many um, helpers and active, uh, active young people helping. On the other hand, um, as a closing remark uh, on the whole of, of the analysis, we have not had time to discuss the views on education, but uh, it was different from the, for the Baltic states, if I remember correctly. But unfortunately, in my country, in Poland, in Hungary, the relationship, or in Slovakia, the, the assessment of the quality of education is, let's say, mixed, right? And unfortunately, that's also the reality. Uh, my experience is that only a certain percentage of our secondary schools is of good quality, and there's a certain percentage that's of very low quality. And then it unfortunately translates also into attitudes to democracy. So this would be my um, Final remark, let's not forget, it's also about what level of education, what quality of education the state provides. Thank you. I, I believe that there is no contradiction be, with what the results say about attitudes towards migration, what, which, means, which meant something different last year when we were asking these questions because it was relating mostly to the Muslims 
uh, and we also measure the attitudes to the m m Muslim uh, people as well. And what we see in Hungary as well is that this year the attitudes are quite different to the refugees coming from uh, Ukraine as well, partly because many Hungarians, I believe, have thought from the beginning that 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 uh, some of the refugees are actually ethnic Hungarians. So we, this, this is a completely different thing. But they also believe that culturally Ukrainians are not that far from the Hungarians as uh, people from Iraq or Afghanistan or, 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 or Syria, for example. But surely one of the long-term effects of the Hungarian government's uh, uh, anti-immigration campaign is the extremely high number of young people uh, who say that they wouldn't like to see a Muslim neighbor uh, in, the, in their home, in their homes or, or in, the, in, the, in the neighborhood um, uh, where they live, while at the same time it seems that for the youngsters LGBT is uh, less and less a problem. Uh, so this is what we found in this uh, research, research and it's true for I believe uh, almost all of the countries, and certainly for Hungary, that while anti-Muslim sentiments uh, go strong, and also anti-Roma sentiments, we haven't touched on this uh, dimension, but this is so well embedded to, into the Hungarian society that still the numbers are strikingly high when it comes to anti-Roma uh, sentiments, but at the same time, anti-LGBT sentiments, I'm, I wouldn't say that it's a non-issue for youngsters, but it's much less as an issue uh, than for older segments of the society, which is also promising for the future. Agnieszka. Well, to answer your question, I don't really know the uh, numbers, uh, the data of how strong uh, support for Ukraine is uh, in the younger uh, generation, but uh, well, seeing how many of young people were engaged or is engaged in uh, uh, this mass movement of uh, helping uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees, how many of them um, was involved in NGOs or just grassroots uh, movements, I, I suppose it is, uh, it is very strong. Uh, at the same time, uh, I believe that the fear that the war would uh, expand beyond the the, the current uh, the, 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 um, area uh, is uh, um, uh, less is is lower among uh, among younger uh, younger pe people than in older uh, generation, which is understandable because the general Polish fear towards um, towards uh, Russia is something that is specific rather uh, rather to uh, to older uh, generations and w one uh, last um, remark uh, about what is uh, extremely important issue and topic uh, for um, young people in Poland and I think in Hungary or maybe I, I don't remember that uh, correctly is the issue of uh, housing crisis of uh, lack of affordable uh, housing a lot of young uh, Poles are still living with their uh, families, not because of the choice, but uh, but uh, just uh, necessity. Uh, so this is also generational um, uh, thing that is uh, hard to understand for the older generation of Poles. So this is yet another uh, example of issue that should be politicized for younger people. Thank you very much. Elena. Yeah, so I started the discussion with sharing a few negative key findings, and I want to end the discussion with sharing a few positive key findings, especially on gender equality, because we discussed this uh, topic at length. Um, so we, we made a few comparisons between the countries, and that was very interesting. However, when we look across time, so if you compare this um, study with previous studies done um, uh, over the past few years, we can really see that there has been a positive shift in the way young people are acceptant of LGBT rights, abortion, and more positive attitudes toward gender equality. So while we are not there yet, it's also important to underline there that there has been a positive shift um, across time. Really great. Thank you for the very positive note, um, especially that the report uh, is also comparing this region to the Baltics which seem to be more modern societies in, in every possible uh, uh, indicators. Uh, but the, we are also uh, progressing right here in Central Europe. However, we seem to be more, more uh, traditional societies compared to the Baltics. 
Uh, this was really very nice. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for all your really nice uh, and good questions. And I think that whatever this report has as, as negative sign or what we evaluate as some worrying fact, this always should uh, encourage us to improve things, then change, right? And of course, the positive things are good basis for for a future action and hope. So thank you very much for all for staying with us and for you, Agnieszka, Olga, Andras and Elena for your stay and contributions. Thank you very much. <laughs>